this whole idea of training till failure and um, what does that mean? Do we need to train till failure? Is that important? Yeah, so failure for an operational definition would be the inability to perform another repetition with proper form. And uh, we carried out a meta analysis recently on this topic. And the bottom line is, is that, and that's kind of the go hard or go home philosophy. You know, that's the bodybuilding mentality of go hard or go home. Every set needs to be taken to failure. Um, the evidence does not indicate that's the case. So certainly you need to train with a high amount of effort. Uh, but to take, uh, all, certainly to take every set to failure is not, not only is it not, doesn't show any benefit for hypertrophy, it actually showed a small detriment for strength. So with strength, stopping a couple reps short of failure seemed to have better effects on uh, maximizing strength than training to failure. I, again, there are some limitations to that research, how much of that, uh, does that mean that if you train to failure, you won't maximize your strength? I'm not necessarily on board with that, but that is what our results showed. Um, I also would not dismiss the fact that for very high level, let's say you're very close to your genetic ceiling, that it might make the need to go to failure, at least on some of the sets, uh, more relevant, uh, beneficial. We don't have good, this is purely speculative on my end, but I can see uh, at least the logical rationale where it makes your challenge, it's a way to challenge the body in a way that it is not used to. Uh, I will tell you that in when I coach bodybuilders, uh, I generally incorporate some failure training, but another area where my view has shifted, maybe not 180, but probably 90 uh, degrees, where uh, I used to be the go hard, go home dude who every set need to be taken to failure, and now most sets within two to three reps of failure. So there's a concept called the repetitions in reserve, and a, a zero, it's the RIR scale, repetitions in reserve. An RIR of zero means you're at failure, means you cannot have done another rep. There's zero reps left before you go to failure. An RIR of one would mean that you, have, you could have done one more rep, and at that rep you would be at failure. From the literature, although we don't have a definitive way of making you know, estimates on this, but I, my own interpretation of the literature is somewhere between probably one to three rep RIR, reps from failure, would be needed to, um, promote optimal adaptations. You can still see adaptations, particularly when you're uh, more in the newbie stage, in the early stages, um, below that. But uh, one to three, I think, is a good general recommendation to uh, that's necessary to see adaptations. Again, then you start getting into the weeds, getting into the nuances. Uh, for the gen pop, I probably would say that's always going to be effective and you probably never have to go to failure. Uh, for the goals of most gen pops. For bodybuilders, high level athletes, perhaps some failure training, the last set to failure on some of your exercises at least. And again, you wanna get into the weeds, probably using your single joint and machine-based exercises would be more appropriate for failure, let's say, than squats or a biceps curl, a lateral raise, a leg extension. Um, they're gonna be, First of all, there's less issue of injury because when you're going to failure, let's say in a squat, and you're if you've ever squatted, yeah. and you're in that you're in the hole and you're trying to push out, there's a greater potential for injury. You get, certainly you're going to need a spotter in that regard, or else you're, you could be stuck and you can have problems. Or a bench press where you're trying to do that rep if you don't have a spotter, your that that uh, bar is stuck to your chest. Whereas if you're uh, doing let's say dumbbell curls or lateral raises, you're, at the very least, you're not gonna be really torched after your sets. You're gonna be able to come back strong. So these are just general, um, it's speculative on my part, but I think there's good logical rationale behind these things. And I do wanna say that uh, an evidence-based approach, so I do wanna promote, uh, one of the things I, I look, my biggest hobby horse in life is to promote the importance of evidence-based practice. It is not simply deferring to research. Research is never gonna tell you what to do, or virtually never. It's gonna provide general guidelines, particularly in the applied sciences like exercise and nutrition. It will get, get you into the ballpark, uh, you know, give you general uh, strategies to use. You then need to take this to the individual. What are their genetics? 
What, are their, what is their lifestyle, their stress level, their sleep, their uh, nutritional status, all of these things together. And then, of course, goals are going to enter into it. Um, so developing a program from the research me, uh, means to understand the research and then to use your own expertise in combination with the goals and abilities of the individual. Right. Um, with the... Um designing the, the training program sort of aspect, we're kind of, I mean, sort of talking about this, this and, um, you know, the training till failure, it sounds like you, I, I, that, that's pretty clear um, for me, like, you know, maybe the bodybuilders, that's a little bit more important, uh, but for most people, getting within one to three reps until failure kind of answers the, well, you get a lot of questions about how many reps do I need to do? How many reps do I need to do? It sounds like it, it depends on the person. And, when you start to feel that fatigue, when you're getting close, you know, right? Like, so that's kind of what I'm thinking for Correct. myself. Um, resting between those reps or between the sets or which way is it? The resting intervals, um, between sets. it's between the sets. So, um, yeah. So, so basically when you're getting ready to do another set, like how many sets do you need to do or how long do you have to rest between them? Is that important? Yeah. So again, this, it's on a spectrum and it depends on it. So when I talk to my students, they'll ask me questions and I say, you know, pretty much any applied question you're going to ask me, I will answer with an it depends. Because um, within broad spectrums, you can get, if you're doing a very minimalist routine, you can make gains. So uh, if you're saying, is it important? It starts to become more and more important, the more important it is to you to maximize your results. Uh, if your goal is just to build some muscle, gain some strength, a very minimalist routine. I mean, training an hour a week, let's say two days, two half hour sessions a week can give you very nice, most people, very nice results, provided you're training hard. Is that going to, if you're looking to be a bodybuilder, is that going to, or you're going to step on stage? No, I, I would say with 100% confidence that is not going to be sufficient to optimize your gain. So volume has been shown to be a driver of hypertrophy. Again, we've done uh, original research on this, we've done um, made an app, made analytic work, and uh, there is a dose response relationship up to a certain point. It is individual specific as well, so some people respond better to or, or respond well to uh, lower volumes, some people need more volume to maximize their results. Um, hard to study individual, resp individual responses, but these are kind of general. Um, insights that we glean from the literature.